Yesterday in Woolwich, which is a part of London, a British soldier was walking down the street wearing a Help for Heroes t-shirt. That's a charity that helps provide for UK soldiers who were wounded in battle. A car carrying two men saw this soldier and rammed him against a pole. Then the two men jumped out of the car, shouted Allah Akbar, which means Allah is great in Arabic, and hacked him to death with a meat cleaver and a knife, trying to literally cut the head off that soldier. All of this was happening in broad daylight on a busy London street. It just happened. Some people just walked right on by. Maybe they didn't notice. Maybe they didn't want to notice. Others stopped in shock, and still others just took out their cell phones to record this stunning event on video and by tweeting about it on Twitter. And the man who had just finished hacking the soldier to pieces was happy to play for the cameras, bloody meat cleaver in hand. He didn't run or hide. He wanted to go on the record in perfect English with his explanation. And he had plenty of time to do so. In fact, nearly 20 minutes elapsed before police bothered to show up. Here's a two-minute statement the murderer delivered to a passenger on a city bus that stopped at the scene. Look. Yeah. The only reason we have killed this man today is because mu Muslims are dying daily by British soldiers. And this British soldier is one, is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. By Allah, we swear by the Almighty no. Allah, we will never stop fighting you until you leave us alone. So what if we want to live by the Sharia in Muslim lands? Why does that mean you must follow us and chase us and call us extremists and kill us? Rather, you are extreme. You are the ones. When you drop a bomb, do you think it picks one person? Or rather, your bomb wipes out a whole family. This is the reality. By a life, I saw your mother today with a buggy. I would help her up the stairs. This is my nature. But uh, we are forced by the Quran in Surah at Toba through many, many ayat throughout the Quran that we must fight them as they fight us. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We ap I, I apologize that women had to witness this today. But in our land, our women have to see the same. You people will never be safe. Remove your governments. They don't care about you. Do you think David Cameron is going to get caught in the street? When we start busting our guns, do you think your politicians are going to die? No, it's going to be the average guy like you and your children. So get rid of them. Tell them to bring our troops back so we, can, so you can all live in peace. Leave our lands and you will live in peace. That's all I have to say. I mean, Allah's peace and blessings be upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's unbelievable. Now this man, now identified as Michael Adebolejo, He's a 28-year-old British-born citizen. He says clearly this was done because of Islam. He said the words Allah, Muslim, Islam, Quran, and Sharia nine times in two minutes by my count. He says his murder was because of Islam and in the name of Islam. He's not trying to hide it. He's not making other excuses for it. In fact, he's quite honest, isn't he? What will be so fascinating in the days ahead is how Western, liberal, non-Muslim apologists do everything they can to de muslify this murder, to come up with explanations or excuses that Adebolejo himself does not want. It's clear Adebolejo was not drunk or high. In fact, I'm sure, as a fundamentalist Muslim, he is an abstainer. He's not crazy, because crazy implies a mental sickness, an illness, which is an excuse that this man clearly does not want. He's not making excuses. He's not trying to avoid responsibility in his rant. The opposite. He is laying out as articulately as he can, as logically as he can, why he did something that might seem crazy to you or me, but to him is not crazy. In fact, it was required for him to do. He says this is about a war between British soldiers and Muslim soldiers. See, he considers himself a soldier in the Grand Jihad, a soldier against Britain, which is interesting given that he was born in Britain. He talks about living by Sharia law in Muslim lands. Now, you might think this is odd, given that he lives under British law in a pluralistic country, Britain. In fact, the official religion in the UK is the Church of England, and one of the Queen's titles is the Defender of the Faith. But fundamentalist Islam believes that the whole world must become Muslim. And in fact, the whole world is just divided between countries in Dar al-Islam, the house of submission to Islam, and Dar al-Kharb, the countries in the house of war, war meaning a jihad to bring them into submission to Islam. Now, under the Geneva Conventions, this guy would not be classified as a soldier. He's a terrorist because he's not part of an army with a chain of command who bears his weapons openly, who wears a uniform, and who follows the laws of war, like not hacking someone to pieces in the middle of a London street. 
But the laws of war are a construction of Western civilization and liberal philosophy. They're secular law, treaties written by mere men. This street butcher follows the law of Allah, written in the Quran, and he actually cited a specific chapter in the Quran permitting his conduct. I don't know if you heard it there. He mentioned the Surah al taba Surah is the Arabic word for chapter. Surah al taba is the ninth chapter of the Quran. I, I'm going to use the authoritative University of Michigan translation here. And chapter 9, verse 5, translated into English, I'll read it to you in part. He sa it says, Slay the idolaters wherever you find them, and take them captives, and besiege them, and lie in wait for them in every ambush. That's from the Quran. That's what he quoted. Now, in case you're wondering, people who don't worship Allah, the Muslim God, are called idolaters and pagans and infidels in the Quran. This means you. This is the law of war that Muslim fundamentalists follow. They don't follow any law of Queen Elizabeth, not any law of the British or Canadian parliaments, not any treaty signed in Geneva 60 years ago. They follow this law, the law of the Quran, which they regard as God's law. Here's chapter 9, verse 14 in the Quran, the same chapter this killer cited, and I quote, Fight them. Allah will punish them by your hands and bring them to disgrace. So this guy goes on in this rant and ends it with an Arabic flourish, saying that the whole statement he just made was in honor of Muhammad, praise be upon him. Now that's not a madman, though he seems mad to our sense of right and wrong. It's not the act of a mere criminal, though it is a crime to our laws, but not to his laws. I doubt that this man would commit a crime like pickpocketing. This wasn't some petty, selfish, materialistic desire he was indulging. I mean, he said he'd help a lady across the street, didn't he? This was a thoughtful act by him. Now, we would call it devilish, but he'd call our gods devils too, wouldn't he? He wasn't ashamed of this, was he? He was proud, proud to make the statement, proud to wait for police. Now, when they showed up, he made a run at them with his accomplice, and the cops shot them down. What can we learn here? The first thing is that multiculturalism doesn't work. You cannot have two competing cultures in the same country. I'm not talking about trivial things like what food you like to eat or what music or dances you like to do. I no, no. I'm talking about basic civilizational values like what law do you follow? What authority do you respect? How do you solve conflicts? Are there any limits on religion in the public square? See, all of those ideas are Western ideas, the separation of church and state. But there is no separation between mosque and state in the Quran. There's no separation between civilian and military in the Quran for those who interpret it literally. And I regret that includes a great many Muslims in the West, let alone in theocracies like Saudi Arabia and Iran. This conflict is not new. We saw it during the cartoon riots of 2006 when Muslim extremists murdered more than 200 people in vengeance for some Danish newspaper cartoons showing a picture of Mohammed that they never even saw. Oh, we saw it when Iran put out a death threat fatwa against Salman Rushdie, the Muslim apostate author and poet living in London, for writing a book called The Satanic Verses. But it goes way back farther than that to the Muslim invasions of Spain, the Ottoman siege of Vienna. That's how far the caliphate, the global theocracy, once reached, all the way into the heart of Europe. For a while, the secular liberal Christian West triumphed, pushing Islam out of Spain and out to the Balkans and back to Turkey. But it's back now with a combination of high Muslim birth rates, while the West's low birth rates and high abortion rate sentences Western countries to demographic decline, with high immigration rates, which the West thinks is a solution to salvaging the welfare state. And all of this is backed up with OPEC money, paid to Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran by the West, and then sent back to the West to radical mosques in the West. Radical Islam is patient. It is accomplishing through immigration and multiculturalism and oil money what it could not accomplish on the field of battle over the centuries. And we cooperate. After this murder, the British Ministry of Defense actually told British soldiers not to wear their uniforms in public in Britain. That was the official response. Now, we've talked about Pamela Geller's posters in U.S. subway stations before, you know, calling on Americans to stand with civilized peoples against, quote, savages. That word savage got a lot of people mad. The York Regional Police here in Canada even suggested it was a hate crime because it was so blunt. But which is worse? 
hacking off a man's head in a city street, or calling such an act by its proper name, savagery. This is not just happening in Britain. For days now, riots have raged in Sweden, of all places. Again, the media would rather just call it the act of youths or the poor, instead of calling things uncomfortable names like Islamic immigrants or jihadists. Two years ago, I interviewed Geert Wilders on this show. He's the Dutch politician who has spoken out against mass Muslim immigration in Holland, who wants to ban the face-obscuring mask worn by some Muslim women. I agreed with some of what Wilders said that day, but I took issue with this comment by him. Stop the Islamization process by outlawing um, uh, ban of, uh, the building of new mosques. I want also uh, Islamic schools to be closed. What is worse than young children, young boys and girls that we want to assimilate and have a full and normal respected life in our societies to grow up in a school where they advocate and teach an ideology of hate. You heard what he wants to say, ban new mosques, shut down Muslim schools in Holland. Uh, he says they're not houses of worship, he says they're academies of war, places where jihadists are grown and whipped up and sent out into the street like Michael Adebolejo, a convert to Islam, by the way, who was radicalized in Britain in a mosque. Now, I'm for freedom of religion. I don't want the government shutting down mosques or churches or synagogues. But Wilders has a point, and it's actually the same point made by that murderer, Adebolejo. It's the same point made in that verse in the Quran. Fundamentalist Islam does not regard mosques as a place where people pray once a week and then live the rest of their lives as Canadians and Britons first. A mosque's purpose is dawah, the promotion of Islam, the conversion of Gentiles. The idea of a mosque being separate from the rest of the community is absurd in fundamentalist Islam. Mosques are higher than the state. They will replace the state. As Canada's latest accused terrorist, Chihab Essegayer, said when he was charged with plotting to blow up via rail a few weeks ago, he said he didn't submit to our criminal code or any secular judge. Here's what he said, and I quote, I need this holy book as a reference for my judgment, he said, talking about the Quran. I don't want a book written by humans. That's what he said. Mosques or schools that teach the destruction of our Canadian laws and government and that counsel violence against our country and against our citizens, places that incubate terrorism and preachers who recruit for it and send out young ticking bombs like Michael Adebolejo. Well, on that, I'd agree with Geert Wilders. Such imams are no different than terrorists and such mosques are no different than terrorist base camps. We are at war, my friends, or to be more precise, others are at war with us, not just overseas, but here in our own countries. Don't take it from me or Gil Wilders. Take it from the man with the bloody meat cleaver standing in the street.